what God has for us in the Word this morning as we continue talking about the power and importance of forgiveness in our lives. always to the very end of the age. That is one of your promises that we cling to every moment of every day. And for that we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well this morning we're going to continue on our series looking at forgiveness. There's an inserts in your bulletin if you can grab that out. There's a pen, pencil, a pew in front of you. Last week, we looked at the four myths or lies of forgiveness that oftentimes we believe that prevent us from coming to that place of forgiving people who have hurt us or wronged us in life. Today, I want to look at the four truths of forgiveness that we need to come to terms with, that we need to realize, that we need to engage. It's based on Colossians 3, 12 through 15, where the Apostle Paul says this, Therefore... As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. I love how the Apostle Paul talks about clothing ourselves and putting on these virtues. Because when you put something on, that's what you're known for. 
And as followers of Jesus, what are we known for? We should be known for these things so that when people think about followers of Jesus, the first things that pop into their mind are, oh, you mean the people who are kind, who are gentle, who are forgiving, who are compassionate? Remember, Jesus described his heart as gentle and humble. Is that what we're known for? When people look at us, this is what they should see. Because that's what people saw in Jesus. And Jesus forgave you. And we are called to do the same. How beautiful would it be is if for people who don't know Jesus out there in the world, that the first thing that popped up into their mind when they thought about those who claim to follow Jesus is, man, those people are forgiving. The heart of God is about healing and wholeness and forgiveness. And that's what we need to be about too, as his followers. And it starts here in this room in community with one another, recognizing that God has forgiven us. And so therefore we're called to forgive one another. So what are those truths of forgiveness? The first one is this, forgiveness is a process. Forgiveness doesn't just happen overnight. Sometimes it takes a while. It's a process. I was a youth pastor for 12 years. And I remember one Wednesday night, I was talking to my high school students about the importance of forgiveness. Afterwards, a girl named Sabrina came up to me. And she said to me, Paul, are you telling me that I need to forgive the person who murdered my father? And I looked at her and I said, Sabrina, yes, because it's what's best for your life. And God loves you and God cares about you. And I can't even imagine the pain hurt and everything that you have gone through and are going through. And I said to her, I completely understand if you cannot forgive the person who murdered your father right now in this moment. But maybe today could be a goal that you set that sometime down the road I'll get to that place where I can forgive him for what he did. And I think that God honors that. Even if you can't forgive in the moment because the hurt and the pain and the woundedness is just so deep that it's going to take a while to get there. I said, Sabrina, God honors that. May it be a goal. And maybe that's what it is for you in your heart or your life woundedness that you have experienced. Yes, it's what's best for our lives. Maybe you can't do it today. But maybe you're going to say, Lord, help me. Lord, give me the strength. Give me the courage. Give me the faith. Work with me, Lord, so that I can get to that place at some point down the road. And whatever that looks like. Remember that forgiveness is a process. It takes time. There is an acronym that I absolutely love that has been so incredibly helpful for me in my walk with Jesus that I want to share with all of you. Write it down. B T G. The B stands for vision. The T stands for time. And the G stands for grace. V, T, G. This is what Jesus gave the disciples. 
He started off in Luke chapter 4. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to set in liberty those who are oppressed, to give sight to the blind, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What was Jesus doing at the beginning of his ministry? He was casting vision for what he would do, for what he would be about. And that's exactly what you see him doing throughout his life, is casting out demons, giving sight to the blind, proclaiming freedom, setting people free. That's the vision that he gave to the disciples as he began life with them. And then over the course of the three, three and a half years, he gave them time to figure it out, to discern it, to live into that vision. And then he gave them grace when they failed, when they didn't understand, when they messed up. What we have to understand is that that's what God gives to us a vision for forgiveness, for hope, for renewal, for new life, and he gives us time to get to that place. And he gives us grace when we fail along the way because he loves us as his kids. And we have to give that to ourselves. Sometimes it's easier to give grace to others than it is to Vision, time, and grace. It's a gift that God gives to each and every single one of us. We must receive that gift and give it away to others as well. Because it's what God has called us to do. The vision of forgiveness. The time that it takes to get there. And the grace along the way that is needed. God gives to us. But forgiveness is more than a process. Forgiveness is essential. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 39, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. You know what's interesting? Is that when the Bible was written, turning the other cheek was a symbol and a sign of forgiveness. So when Jesus is effectively saying, to the earliest followers is that when somebody wrongs you, it is absolutely essential for you to turn the other cheek and to forgive right away, as fast as you can. And if it takes time to get there, then so be it. But forgiveness is absolutely essential for us as followers of Jesus. It is what we need to be known for. Because that's what Jesus was known for in his life. As he cried out from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is essential because it stops the vicious cycle of hatred and anger and violence and vengeance. It frees us. Remember, because forgiveness isn't about the other person. It's not for them. It's for us. It sets us free from the anger, from the bitterness, from the hatred. It's essential for our relationship with God. It's essential for our relationship with one another as we live together in communion. That's why it was so radically important for Jesus. Because the cycle of hate can be broken through love, through forgiveness. And that takes tremendous courage, doesn't it? It doesn't take much courage to hate someone back. It doesn't take much courage to be a person of vengeance. 
but it takes a tremendous amount of courage to follow in the way of Jesus, to turn the other cheek, and to forgive that person who has wronged us. But as we said last week, sometimes that act of forgiveness will bring conviction into their heart and into their life. Maybe it will wake them up and have them come to their senses so they would come to that reality and that truth and reflect upon themselves and maybe what they need to change. Forgiveness is not only essential, it is healing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know, I used to read that verse where it says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I think, well, you're not talking about me because I don't always feel very righteous very holy, very special, talking about someone else. But then the Lord revealed something to me. The truth is that all of us are righteous. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of what God has done for us in the life, ministry, death, and victorious resurrection of Jesus from the dead. God has made us righteous through the shed blood of his son Jesus on the cross. And so when he looks at us, he sees his son, and we are washed, and we are pure, and we are holy in his sight. We have been made right with God. He has forgiven us of all of our sins, past, present, and future. And therefore, our prayers are powerful and effective. We need to believe that. Jesus was a man of deep prayer. God imaged for us, modeling for us what we are supposed to do in our lives. He's praying in the garden. He's praying on the mountain. We are called to be people of prayer and believe in faith that our prayers are powerful and effective. And one of the things we need to do is pray for healing. And healing comes through forgiveness. Jesus is the Savior. The word Savior comes from a Latin word, salve. It's a healing ointment that we put on wounds. The word salvation comes from a Greek word, sozo, that literally means healing. Jesus is the Savior because he is the healer. He has come to bring salvation. In other words, Jesus has come to heal our relationship with God, to heal our relationship with one another, to heal our relationship with the world. And it comes through forgiveness. God wants what's best for our lives. He wants wholeness. He wants flourishing. He wants resurrection. He wants new beginnings. And the truth is that this comes when we forgive ourselves, when we forgive others, and when we choose to confess our sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be because there is power in naming things. Forgiveness names the wrong that was done. And then at the same time, it sets us free to move forward into the new beginning that God has for us. That's the healing power of forgiveness. There's a tension where it holds that which is in the past and yet sets us free to a new beginning, to a fresh start of what God has in store for us as his people. 
Not only is forgiveness healing, forgiveness is a choice. You know why? Because the heart of forgiveness is love. Because that's who God is. That's the one controlling, dominant attribute that we read about in Scripture. That God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So anything that we want to say about God flows essentially first and foremost from the fact that God is love. And love is always a choice. In our culture, we romanticize love to a feeling or to an emotion. But that's not the biblical view of love. What did the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it keeps no record of wrongs. We don't always feel like being kind. We don't always feel like being patient. We don't always feel like being forgiving. Oftentimes we feel like keeping a record of wrongs. What did the scriptures say? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, that he did something. He demonstrates his love for us in this, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Love is an attitude, it is a behavior, it is a choice. Jesus didn't feel like dying on a cross. That's why he prayed three times in the garden, if there's any way that I don't have to go to the cross, Lord, please make another way. But yet, he came to a place of surrender and said, not what I want, but what you want. Because he knew that going to the cross would provide that healing and that wholeness and that forgiveness for the world. To pay the debt for their sins. So that we could be restored and renewed. Jesus chose love. And we must choose it as well. We don't always feel like forgiving people. But we need to pray and ask the Lord to help us through the power of the Holy Spirit as an act of love for the other to forgive them. If we can do it in the moment, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And if we're going to work toward it, so we get there at some point down the road, and hallelujah, praise the Lord, that it's a goal, that it's on the radar screen, that we're open to the new beginning that God has in store for us because he wants our healing, and he wants our hope, and he wants us to be healed. And we need to choose forgiveness. So now, here's the question. How do you know? Right? How do you know when you've come to that place that you have truly forgiven that other person in your heart? What's the test? Here's what I think it is. Do you wish that other person well. Can you honestly say and reflect in your own heart, in your own life, as you've been praying, as you've been discerning, as you choose to forgive the other person, do you wish 
them well. That they would experience healing. That they would experience wholeness. Do you want what's best for them in their lives? Because it's what God wants for you. Do we wish them well? And that they would experience God's love and his power and his transformative spirit and love so that they can be set free too. Yeah. That's what God wants for us. That's what he wants for me. That's what he wants for you because we are his kids. And so I'm praying that all of us would choose forgiveness. <clears throat> choose to forgive ourselves. Choose to forgive each other. Choose to forgive those outside of this room who don't deserve it. That need it and we need to be set free from it. So that we can live into the new reality that God has for us as his people. May we experience the power of forgiveness. The healing that comes with it. The freedom the joy that comes when we choose to follow Jesus in his way. Because his way is better. Always has been. And always will be. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for the witness that we have in Jesus of Nazareth. And how he modeled the power of forgiveness <coughs> to all those around him. And so I pray that we would consider it and the power that it could have in our lives to set us free, to heal us, to unite us to you, to unite us to one another, and to help us move in your spirit, kingdom, authority, and power together as a faith family. United in your love, united in your grace, united in your compassion, ready and open and excited for whatever new things you have in store for us as we seek to reach the community with the good news of Jesus and the gospel and the hope that only you can truly provide. God, we love you. And thank you for your grace that is sufficient for us, for your power is made perfect in our weakness. God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
present in our offering as a way for us to respond and say, Thank you, Jesus, for what you have given me. Everything is a gift we want to use in advancement and service of the kingdom of God.
with Romans 15, 13. Well, Father, I just want to say thank you so much for bringing in boxes of cereal for Madisonville Primary School, the domino effect of kindness. Continue to bring in those boxes of cereal. We're also going to be doing an Easter egg hunt coming up for the kids in the community as well. So we're going to need you to bring in candy individually wrapped. That would be awesome. So bring in individually wrapped pieces of candy and continue to bring in those boxes of cereal as well as we seek to make a difference here in the community where God has placed us. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as we go out into God's creation, know that the power of the Holy Spirit of God is within each and every single one of you, empowering you to do the things that Jesus did. So walk in the power of the Spirit throughout this week, and let God use you to make a massive impact in the community for him and for his love and for his light and for his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in peace and love well. Thank you.